Hello everybody and greetings from Islamabad. The blasphemy business is booming around here these days. If you want to steal somebody's property, destroy his business or have some score to settle, all you need to do is go to your friendly neighborhood mullah and say, that person said something about the Holy Prophet or his companions or anything that could be construed as not properly Islamic. And in no time, you will have a howling mob that will come descend upon that person, tear him to pieces, and your job's done. Let me give you an example. There was a young man, 23 years old, by the name of Mishal Khan. He was a student at Abdul Wali Khan University in Mardan, which is about 70 miles or so from here. And the university administration wanted him gone. Well, he was a progressive young man, and he had a Facebook page in which he carried out discussions with other students. By the way, he was enormously popular because he would take students' cases, such as somebody being excessively charged in terms of fees or uh, being victimized by some teacher or whatever, and he'd go to the administration. Whenever he went to the administration, he got a whiff of corruption, and as he investigated, it became deeper and deeper. The administration tried to get rid of him, and this, by the way, I learned from his father, who I visited last week. The administration first planned to have him killed and his body thrown into the river. Well, that didn't work out. So they told their, their pet students that, um, you know, he's a blasphemer. Why don't you go after him? And so they went to the nearby village in a jeep with a, loud, with a mounted loudspeaker and said, Islam is in danger. The prophet has been blasphemed against. Come, come. And so the very next day, there's a crowd of 57. And among them was Mishal Khan's roommate, who he had befriended multiple times. They first stripped him naked. Then they beat him with sticks and then with bricks. And finally, one student took out his pistol and shot him dead. All this while 400 other students were looking on, making a video of this with their smartphones, and not one did anything to help Mishael Khan. As I said, I went to see his father, who's a really wonderful, brave man, who's standing up alone today, and he told me that because of the national furor, there was a joint investigation team that had been set up by the Supreme Court of Pakistan, which found that he had not blasphemed, that he had been targeted for revealing layers of corruption in the university administration. And just to give you one example, the university has on its payroll 300 security guards, and 200 of them work as private servants in the homes of the bigwigs around that place. This is not the first or the only case. This is now so usual. It's heartrending. How could his own fellow students have become animals? How could they have torn him to pieces like, like mad men? But it's happened and it'll happen again. And it's happened throughout his human history. Look at Europe 300 years ago. It was barbaric and savage, just like we are today. And so, my friends, here in Pakistan, we will have to do what they did in Europe 300 years ago, pay the price. We will, we will have to sacrifice ourselves. But we know that we shall win. We shall win because the forward thrust of humanity is unstoppable. So no matter what these religious fanatics do with us, we know that we shall prevail. So be of good cheer and goodbye. Hello everyone. I wish I could be among you for this important event organized thanks to Mariam again. 
The last time we met, it was uh, before the 7th of January, before the terrorist attack against Charlie Hebdo. And at this moment, I, I wish I could say that at least because of the violence of what we all faced, we could have hoped that some propaganda will have stopped. That we, will, that we would stop to hear, for example, that all the trouble in the world, all the fanatic violence is the result of too much of secularism, too much of equality, too much of freedom of expression. But unfortunately, as you all know, we did continue to hear a lot, a lot of bullshit. A lot of propaganda explaining that finally, somehow, the victims were the one to blame instead of the terrorists, instead of the killers. I even, I even heard some uh, English-spoken journalists from English media or American media explain to me that somehow because France was a so secularist country and that because we debate so much about those issues, we will become not fascist but almost. That we will vote all for National Front at the end of those debates. Well, we are here today after the Brexit, after the fact that the American did elect Donald Trump, somehow also because it is a form of backlash for a certain left, we didn't face enough those issues. And I'm not saying that everything is perfect, but at least when we speak about secularism, we have a way to express a constructive resistance to fanatism. If it is not this way, if there is no a way to express this resistance, then hate will win. Because this is exactly what the fanatics want at the end, is to provoke hate and to obtain it. But what we have in common um, in this room is definitely that we think that there is a constructive way to resist. And it's even a universal way, because nobody, whatever we are born in Iran, born in Pakistan, born in London or in Paris, nobody loves to live in society where the more brutal, the more fanatics, the more violence can make the rule. And this is why um, we can hope to be more and more, because we are definitely looking for a model of society who makes, more, makes us far more happier than the world where the fanatics makes the rules. So thank you again to Mariam for letting us having those meetings where we can at least count how much we are and how strong we are. Well, I just wanted to take a moment and welcome all of you to this international conference on freedom of conscience and expression in the 21st century. I think the work that you're doing is incredibly important around the world, especially those vexed Muslims, many of whom uh, are at risk for promoting the freedom to simply criticize religion and think freely. I can't think of a more important effort right now. And even as you're under siege in many countries, I want to encourage you to continue your good work, which helps provide hope to many people around the world and I find incredibly brave and impressive. So congratulations to all of you. I'm sorry I can't be there right now to celebrate and discuss with you, but uh, my thoughts are with you. Take care. I want to thank Mariam Namazi for giving me this opportunity to say a few words to you. As you know better than I, it takes great courage to be an apostate from Islam. The main thing is, I think, to get through to the children of Islam, that you are good people, you are many, you have found ways to live good lives outside the boundaries of Islam, and I offer my support in any way I can to help you achieve those ends. Congratulations. Hello, good day to everybody. I'm quite pleased to be allowed to, and honored in fact, to be allowed to have a contribution in this very important conference on uh, the necessity of freedom to speak. 
And I, I come from a country which is a long censorious tradition and a long religious tradition. Uh, and the two have been complementary to each other. Uh, they have inherited a culture of fake news, which began with the Bible, which seems to have been the original source of fake news. And since then, uh, based on this fake news, they have built uh, an anti-civilization. And that anti-civilization has directed its energy towards disempowering women, covering up for the abuse of children, uh, discriminating against uh, people of a different sexual orientation from the normal, what they regard as the normal heterosexual uh, sexual relations. And uh, there has been a long struggle against this type of thing in Ireland. And what we had, you only have to think and listen to the terms like the Magdalen Laundries, the Tomb Babies, the Pedophilia Scandal, the rule by Archbishop Char John Charles McQuaid. Ireland was indeed a very strict uh, country filled with religiosity. Uh, at one time we probably had more priests than we had doctors or school teachers or scientists. Thankfully it is declining today and the world will be a much better place without the fake news of religion. An example of how things have moved on for society in Ireland was the recent controversy over the National Maternity Hospital. There were strong suggestions and recommendations from government that the National Maternity Hospital should be rebuilt and given to the nuns who would be in charge of it. There was immediate uproar that, once again, Ireland seemed prepared to throw pregnant women and children to the nuns, who had a long history of abuse. Now the nuns have relinquished any control of the new uh, National Maternity Hospital which has been built and it's that sort of success that gives us hope but we need to be vigilant at all times because the reactionaries, the clerics, the right wing religious Catholic lobby will try at any time to make a comeback. And in this battle against uh, these type of ideas the concept of free speech is very important. I know at times we are often called free speech fundamentalists, uh, as if we are no better uh, than the religious fundamentalists whom we criticise. But free speech is the antidote to fundamentalism. It breaks down narratives. It allows people to think. It allows us to question. And very importantly, as a friend reminded me this morning, it does what John Stuart Mill says it should do. It allows us to get to the truth. Now for years fake news has been preventing us from getting to the truth and the longer we insist on the absolute right to freedom of expression and the right to be free from censorship then we will be in a much more advantageous, tedious, a much more advantageous position within society. I'd like to thank Mariam Namazi for allowing me to deliver this short speech to you all and to apologize in advance for my clumsy English. Let me tell you about a word. You are activists, lawyers, journalists, professors, writers. You all know how much words are important. Unfortunately, the word I want to tell you about is missing in many languages. You find it in Italian, in Spanish, but not in English. So I will use it in French. This word is laicite. It's usually, and wrongly, translated into secularism. But laicite is much more, much more than just secularism. So laicite is an idea, a law and a message sent to citizens and to religious authorities. Laicite specifies clearly that state do not recognize any religion, that state is a faced. Laicite says that religions must stay away from state matters and more important from laying down the laws. Because history and current events all over the world show that religion and are politically incompatible with democracy. When religions step into political field, it's chaos, totalitarianism, 
and darkness. Laicity is the first condition for democracy, for equality, for knowledge, for freedom of speech and conscience, for everything you people cherish. So, even if it does not exist in your common language, use this word, fight for it and for the values it carries. Thank you. I am Annie Sugier. I am president of the League of the International Women's Rights, created by Simone de Beauvoir. And for me as feminist, it's clear that religions are patriarchal ideologies. Uh, and secularism is a precious tool for women, for women's emancipation. But this is not always understood, even by women themselves. And it's important for us to find a field of activity where we can show that, for instance, political Islam is making uh, pressure, is lobbying the International Federation to impose their segregation rule against women. And this is the reason why we have written a book called uh, How Islamists Perverted Olympus. And we show this lobbying of Iranian and Saudi Arabia to modify uh, what is the characteristic of sport, a unified rule, ethical and technical rules. And for instance, these countries are the only ones uh, who forbid uh, uh, to women entering in stadium. And we want them to be excluded. We launched a campaign on this issue. And we hope you will understand that sport is not a secondary area of activity. It's an essential one, as Mandela understood when he was struggling against racial apartheid. Struggle, please, against sexual apartheid. Uh, so I am Linda Veikuriel. Uh, and I also belong to the League for the International Rights for Women. One Law for All is our slogan, but that we apply to sports. As we all know, sports rules are the same all over the world. They are universal. And the Olympic Charter itself is based on universal values that rule the Olympic Games. The Charter clearly states that no political or religious demonstration is allowed in any Olympic site. Athletes compete in sports costume, men and women alike. That was true until the crafty Iranian mullah decided otherwise and imposed a change of sports rule applying only to women, supposedly Muslim women were then compelled to dress as religion dictates without the IOC batting an eye. Haven't you noticed those cloaked women on the field when other athletes are in sports normal attire? We at the league are the only movement to protest to the distortion of the common rule in order to impose on women the stigma of submission. We need you, we need one law for all to be enforced. Come and join our, our fight. Greetings, my name is David Rand, President, Atheist Freethinkers in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. On the occasion of the International Conference on Free Expression and Conscience in London, our organization sends its greetings and expresses its solidarity with the goals of the conference as well as support for ex-Muslims throughout the world. In particular, we wholeheartedly support efforts by Miriam Namazi and her colleagues of the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain to fight back against attempts to silence criticism of Islamism and Islamist regimes. Attempts at censorship come all too often from those who claim to be progressive but who foolishly enable Islamofascism by bullying its critics. 
Slanderous accusations of so-called Islamophobia are a propaganda tool which stifles debate and also compromises the freedom of Muslims themselves, such as when sexual minor minorities from a Muslim background attempt to criticize Islamic homophobia. In Canada, atheist freethinkers fights to reverse a parliamentary motion denouncing so-called Islamophobia. We also fight to repeal a religious exception in Canada's hate propaganda legislation, which allows impunity for hateful speech based on religious belief. We wish you a productive conference and look forward to working with you and all others who oppose obscurantism and support atheism, secularism, freedom of expression, and conscience. Thank you.